Hello everyone. Today the girl crusoes are going to fish. Let's get started. Chapter 8 The Fishers Up with the sun next morning, the girls began the day by bathing in a little secluded pool where there was no danger of being interrupted by a shark. Immediately after breakfast, they set off to the of their hut, looked cautiously around to make sure that no one had been there, and began to weave the grasses they had prepared the day before. Elizabeth was at first rather slow, but the others worked quickly, and by dinner time they had each finished a mat several feet square. You two have quite outstripped me, said Elizabeth as they returned to the boat. I'll go on with my mat after dinner, while you'll see what you can do to make some fishing tackle. Right, cried Tommy. You shall have fish for supper, you're good. They dined on bananas and coffee ruefully noticing that the tin of condensed milk was nearly empty. Then Mary and Tommy went up the stream to a place where they had seen plumper canes, which would furnish any number of fishing rods. They selected one about six feet long, and after a good deal of trouble, the wood being tough, cut it down. Tommy brought out of her pocket two or three pieces of string of unequal length and thickness, and knotted them together. There's our line, she said, and it's lucky there's no one here to laugh at it. How can we fasten it onto the rod? asked Mary. Tie it, of course. Tommy proceeded to tie the string to the thinner end of the rod. Oh, bother, she said. The cane's so smooth the string slips down every time. This won't do. Let's make a hole in the rod and put the string through it, suggested Mary. The cane is sure to split if we try to bore it. A hole with a knife, said Tommy. I know. There's a sort of spike in my knife. We'll make it red hot, and then I dare say we can bore a clean hole. They ran back to their little camp on the beach, where Elizabeth was still at work on her mat. How are you getting on? asked Mary. Faster now, replied Elizabeth. I shall beat you both soon. They told her what they had done, and Tommy thrust the spike into the fire, which they never allowed to go out. Meanwhile, Mary hunted for something that would serve as a hook. She gave a cry of delight when she discovered a strong safety pin, and Tommy having by this time bored a hole neatly through the cane, they very soon had their rough and ready tackle complete. It only remained to bait the hook. They found plenty of small shellfish clinging fast to the rocks on the shore, and they pried these up with their knives and provided themselves with a number of the little molas. Thus equipped, they went along the shore in search of a spot that promised success. They were both excited, and Elizabeth was so much interested in the experiment that she laid down her mat and followed her sisters. After a little time, they came to an irregular line of rocks running from the base of the cliffs towards the reef on which they had nearly struck on approaching the island. They had already observed that some of the rocks always stood above water, while others were sometimes submerged. These latter were easily distinguishable by the seaweed and the limpets with which they were covered. At the present moment, the tide was going down, and the girls thought that they would have a good chance of catching some of the fish that had probably come up with the tide. Accordingly, they made their way for some distance along the rocky barrier. The sea was pretty calm, owing to the protection of the reef, but every now and then there was a dash of spray over the rocks at the farthest end. Choosing a rock that was lashed by broken water on the seaward side, and had a deep, calm pool on the landward side, they determined to try their luck. I can see hundreds of fish darting about, said Mary, peering into the pool as Tommy baited the hook. The more the merrier, said Tommy. Look out, Bess, I don't want to hook you, dear. The other girls gave Tommy a white bird as she cast her hook, then came to her side and waited for the expected catch. She had not put on the float, declaring that any fish worth catching would soon make itself felt. But as she drew the line towards her, she had no sense of weight or resistance. The hook came up with the bait untouched. They don't fancy it apparently, said Tommy. I have another try. Look out! Again, she cast the line, and again drew it in. I declare, the little wretches are nibbling the bait off under our very noses, she cried as the hook passed through the clear water of the pool. How disgusting! Poor little things, why shouldn't they enjoy themselves? said Mary. Oh, you're going to talk like that? I'm done! said Tommy, flinging down the rod impatiently. Elizabeth picked it up. Let me try, she said. 
he painted the hood again, but had no more success than her sister. It is exasperating, she said. I'm surprised the fish here are so clever. You'd better have tried the bent pin as I suggested, said Mary. You'd have caught some of the little chaps swarming there. The safety pin is too big for them. Who wants skinny little things, said Tommy. I'd like a handout or a card. Let me try again, Bess. Once more, the hook was baited and let down. Again, it was surrounded by a swarm of eager nibblers, and Tommy was on the point of drawing it back in disgust when suddenly the crowd of little fish parted and scattered in all directions, darting off like streaks of light. The girls held their breath as they saw a whopper, as Tommy called it, come slowly towards the bait. He seemed to smell at it, moving round with flicks of his tail. Then he opened his mouth, and Tommy felt a tug on the line. Got him! she cried triumphantly. A monster, too! The other girls watched her as she drew it in. She wasted no time in playing it, but simply hauled it up towards a rock. Bess stooped, and while Mary held her to prevent her from stumbling to the sea, she slipped her hands underneath the fish and jerked it out of the water. He's not such a monster after all, said Mary. How deceptive the water is! The fish, indeed, was no bigger than a good-sized head dog. It is big enough to make us a good supper, said Elizabeth, and I don't think we should try to catch any more now. They won't keep in this climate. Tommy can catch some every day she likes. All right, said Tommy, but I say I can't wait till supper time. The look at the fish gives me an appetite. I vote we have it for tea. You're cooked, Bess. I'll finish your mat while you're getting the fish ready. This was agreed upon, and they returned to the camp. The two younger girls resumed the weaving. While Elizabeth, using a flat stone as a kitchen table, set about cleaning the fish in a very housewifely manner. All at once, Mary dropped her hands and cried, Oh! What's the matter? asked Tommy. Suppose a fish is poisonous. Some are, you know. Goodness, yes, what can we do? We haven't a taster, like some old kings I read about. Don't worry, said Elizabeth tranquilly. We must have a change of food, and there's bound to be a little risk in trying new things. We'll cook it and I'll eat a little. We shall soon know if there's any harm in it. Oh no, Bess, said Mary. Why should you take the risk? Somebody must, and I'm the eldest, and the toughest, I expect, so that if it does make me ill, I shall get over it sooner than you. And I did so want a snack, sighed Tommy. You won't eat much, will you, Bess? We couldn't spare you, you know. I'll be careful, said Elizabeth with a smile. It looks very tempting, doesn't it? Don't, Bess, you'll make my mouth water, said Tommy. How are you going to fry it? I thought of boiling it in the kettle. I wouldn't do that, said Mary. I don't care for fishy tea. It would take ages to get the taste out of the kettle. But I don't see how we can fry it without a frying pan. Take it, said Tommy. Let's make an oven, I'll show you. She ran to the beach and collected a number of stones, which she brought back and arranged in the shape of a small circle. Outside this, she placed a second circle and filled the space between the two with dried grasses, brushwood, and twigs. Now, Bess, she said, put a portion of the fish in the inner circle. Then we'll set light to the field and cover it all over with stones, and the fish will bake in no time. But it will be smoky, protested Mary. Now we wrap it in leaves. Let's try, at any rate. If it doesn't succeed, we shan't have spoiled much. The fish was wrapped in leaves, as Tommy suggested placed on a stone in the midst of the small circle. Then, having pressed the fuel firmly together so that it should not burn away too quickly, Elizabeth kindled it from the fire and covered it with stones, leaving a few spaces for the passage of air. They were so much interested in their experiment that they sat idly by about the novel oven, waiting until the fish should be cooked. Every now and again, Tommy would lift off one of the stones as how the cooking was proceeding. The leaves are turning brown, she would say delightedly. And what a lovely smell! After about a quarter of an hour, they removed the stones and the wrappings, and Elizabeth declared the fish was done. It doesn't look so nice as if we had egg and breadcrumbs, she said, but we must do without those luxuries. She tasted a small portion. Very nice, in spite of no salt or pepper. Don't eat too much, said Mary anxiously. I must give it a fair trial. Make the tea, Tommy, will you? A cup of tea will qualify the poison if there is any. What a nerve you got, said Tommy admiringly. Soon all were drinking tea, and the younger girls munched bananas, while Elizabeth ate a few small pieces of the baked fish. 
They watch her with anxiety mingle with envy. Really, you mustn't eat anymore, said Tommy at last. Now rest against the side of the boat. She placed a shawl behind her sister's head and covered her feet with her Macintosh. Anyone would think I was an invalid, said Elizabeth laughing. It's nothing to laugh at, said Mary severely. You may be very ill by and by. Meanwhile, put the rest of the fish where the flies and insects can't get at it, said Elizabeth. There's a nice little hollow in that rock over there. Cover it with leaves. This time, they sat one on each side of Elizabeth, propping their chins on their hands and gazing at her with mournful interest. This is too absurd, said Elizabeth after a few minutes. Let us get on without hunt. I can't stand being stared at like this. Come along, girl. We must cut down some more canes to make walls. I'll show you what I mean. They went upstream to the clumber canes and, selecting some of the longest, proceeded to hack them down with their knife. No easy task, for the longest canes were also the thickest. But after a little trouble, they got three or four that Elizabeth thought would answer her purpose and took them to the site chosen for the hut. Here they laid the canes across the projecting branches of the three trees, binding them firmly in place with strong tendrils of a creeping plant. After an hour's work, all the canes were in position, forming a kind of framework for the roof. Now all we have to do is cover this with matting, and our roof is finished, said Elizabeth. We shall have to get some more canes to stretch matting on for the walls, and as we have used up nearly all the grasses we collected, we had better go at once to get some more ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow, cried Mary. I'd forgotten. Do you feel quite well, Bess? As well as possible. How long is it since you ate the fish? asked Tommy. More than two hours. Long enough for the poison to act, I'm sure. So we may make up our minds that the fish is perfectly wholesome, and there's baked fish or supper for all of us tonight. Hooray! said Tommy, beginning to dance. Let's go and get the grasses. By the time we have got enough to make our mats, it'll be supper time. Oh, I'm so glad you're not ill, Bess. They spent an hour or two in gathering grasses and returned to their little camp shortly before sunset in order to cook their supper before dark. Tommy ran to the hole in the rock where the fish had been left. A cry of dismay startled her sisters. What is it? They cried, turning towards her. It's gone! Every bit of it! Oh, who has stolen it? She looked around with alarm in her eyes, and the other girls also glanced about them with consternation and anxiety. Was it possible that someone had been spying on them? I did see somebody that day, said Tommy in a whisper. But who would want to steal a bit of fish? said Elizabeth with practical common sense. If there are natives here, they go fish for themselves, I'm sure. There aren't any cats in these parts, are there, Mary? asked Tommy. I never read of them, but good gracious! He cried suddenly, There are the bones! I looked a little farther into the hole than Tommy had done, and there lay the skeleton of the fish picked clean of every bit of flesh. I know what it is, she said. It's a land crab hole, and the wretch smelt the fish, I suppose, and came out for a feast while we were busy. A mean thing, cried Tommy, and we shan't have any fish or supper after all. I'll serve him out! She ran to the boat and brought back the boat hook, with which she poked vigorously in the hole. In a few minutes, a large crab came scuttling out, at the side of which she picked out her skirt and ran away, not liking the look of his formidable nippers. They supped as usual on bananas and tea, resolving to choose a safer larder when next they kept fish for a future meal. Chapter 9 The Little Brown Face I say, my hair is in a terrible tangle, said Mary the next morning after they had bathed. I wish we had a comb. In the haste of their dressing, the last night on the Elizabeth, they had done up their hair anyhow, forgetting all about their combs. What do the South Sea natives do, Mary? asked Elizabeth. I fancy I've read that they build their hair up in a sort of huge turban with grease and things. Alright, said Tommy. I vote we cut our hair short like a boy's. You got a pair of scissors in your housewife, Mary. Then it won't bother any of us. I don't think that would be wise, said Elizabeth. We might get a sunstroke. As it is, we are protected a little. I'm going to let my hair down. Perhaps we might make a comb out of a bit of wood. A long fiddling job that would be, said Tommy. I'm going to catch a fish for breakfast. And if it's like the one I caught yesterday, take out the backbone and use that for a comb. That's rather an original idea, said Elizabeth. Won't our hair smell fishy though? 
Now we wash the bone and then dry it in the sun, I should think. Anyway, we can try. The girls went off together to the rocks from which they had fished on the previous day. The first fish they hooked was of a different kind from the one whose wholesomeness they had proved. Hami threw it back into the sea, saying that she could not wait while another experiment was being tried. After a time, she landed one the right sort, and this, when baked, made a capital breakfast for them all. No biscuit remained, and Tommy sighed for bread and butter, but they enjoyed the change of fare. They washed the skeleton as Tommy had suggested, and set it to dry in the sun. Then, they resumed their weaving. Elizabeth made some rough measurements, and found that a great deal more matting was required than they anticipated, so that several days must pass before they could begin the actual building of the hut. Mary and Elizabeth had both set their watches by their son, and so were able to tell with reasonable accuracy the time of day. But they had not kept count of the days that they passed, and now Elizabeth suggested that they should each morning cut a notch in one of the trees to serve as a calendar. That night they tested the comb of fishbone. Mary's hair was the finest. She managed to comb out its tangles fairly well. But when Elizabeth tried to do the same with her thicker and stronger locks, several of the bones snapped off, and it was clear that a new comb of this sort would be needed every day. She reverted, therefore, to her idea of trying to make a wooden comb. And during the next few days, Mary, who had some practice in fretwork at home, worked with her knife at a thin fragment of wood. It was a difficult task. She found herself quite unable to make a teeth equal in size or equal in distance from each other. But she persevered, and on the third evening after starting the work, she showed the comb to her sisters. Well, it's halfway to the curry comb and the garden rake, said Tommy with a laugh, but I dare say it's better than fish bones. Let me have first go on my thatch. She began to operate on her hair, a little yell every now and then proclaiming that the teeth had caught. But all the girls voted that it was better than nothing, and they used it in turn every morning and night. When there were six notches on the tree, Elizabeth said that she thought there was enough matting to complete the walls of the hut, so they carried their handiwork up to the knoll. Tommy climbed up into the trees and fastened the upper edges of several mats to the overhanging box, while the other girls stuck a double roller case into the ground, one inside and the other outside the matting, to be steady. Various strips of matting had to be sewn together, and at these places an extra long cane was introduced, to which the mats were fastened by means of thin, flexible tendrils. A day's work sufficed to complete three walls, the fourth side facing the sea left open. It now only remained to complete the roof. Next day, the girls added other canes to those which they had already laid across their branches until they formed the closed lattice work. This they covered with matting, and then deliberated whether to finish it off with thatch. As children, they had often helped the thatchers at the farm, though that they would not find any difficulty in the work. But they guessed that in so warm a climate, thatch would harbor insect pests of all kinds and they did not feel comfortable at the thought of having such housemates. Still, I must think we must chance it, said Mary. There's one thing to be said, and that is, if the whole controversy is so slight and simple that we can make it all happen all over again if necessary. That's all very well, said Tommy, but we aren't spiders, and I shall be pretty mad if there's all this work to do again. I'd rather do something fresh. We haven't found much else to occupy us so far, said Elizabeth. Anyway, we won't ask you to do a repair, Tommy, if you don't like it. Oh, I didn't mean that, said Tommy. I'll do my fair share. But I know I shall get a bit ratty if silly old storm knocks our nice hut to pieces. The touching occupied two more days, and then the girls looked with a great deal of pleasure on their neat little hut. But we haven't done yet, said Elizabeth. The thatch will protect us from any ordinary rain, but we're still liable to get swamped by water running down the hill behind. We had better scrape out a trench all around to carry the water down the shore. This proved the hardest part of the work. They had no tools except their knives and the boat hook, and with these to cut a trench deep enough to be effective was very trying to their patience. Such continuous flooding work did not suit Tommy's restless, active temperament at all, and she would constantly jump out and run off to the beach or to the edge of the wood. At such times, Mary was inclined to be impatient and reproachful. But Elizabeth said that they mustn't expect too much from Tommy. 
is very young, you know, and it's really wonderful how our spirits are kept up so well. She's more nervy than we are, Mary, and I'm always afraid she will break, break down. So neither she nor Mary said anything to tell me about her faithfulness. And Tommy herself always came back repentant after these little absences and worked away hard until the next piece of recklessness overtook her. To give her a change for scraping away at the trench, Elizabeth suggested that she should make a mat curtain for the open side of the hut. We don't want a door, she said, but the curtain will be used for at night. Leave a little space between it and the roof for ventilation. You can fasten the two lower corners in the cane. Tommy set about this task willingly, at the curtain thick by the time the trench was finished. The hut was now complete so far as its exterior was concerned. It had taken more than a fortnight altogether. What they had now to consider was the internal fittings. Tommy laughed when this was mentioned. We can't get a bedroom suite, even on the higher system, she said. I suppose you call it the bed sitting room, wouldn't you? Let's call it our flat, suggested Mary. The best flat there ever was, said Tommy. No botheration from unpleasant neighbors. At least, I hope not. We certainly shan't have a tiresome piano going next door, said Elizabeth. I think our flat is a very good name. What a pity we haven't had a table and pen, ink and paper. Then Mary could write a diary of our doings. With moral reflections, added Tommy. Today, our younger sister reveals the wash up. How sad to see such a selfish spirit in one so young. That's the sort of thing, isn't it, Mary? Shouldn't write anything in the sort, said Mary indignantly. You haven't refused to wash up, and if you did, do you think I should tell it? My dear, you're perfectly killing, said Tommy. Do you think you'll get your old diary published? No one would read it if you did. We're talking nonsense, aren't we, said Elizabeth. There's no chance of us and here us writing a diary. Let's be practical. The only furniture we can supply ourselves is beds. What weaving? cried Tommy. Oh, I'm so sick of it, Bess. Can we sleep on the ground? I don't think we'd better. We might get rheumatism. Though to be sure the ground seems dry enough at present. But I own that waving match day after day is rather tiring. So shall we leave it for a present? Still sleep in the boat? What do you say to doing a little more exploration? Yes, why not? said Tommy eagerly. We haven't seen a soul since I saw that figure move along the top of the ridge. At any rate, and I dare say there was an animal of some kind. I don't think there are any people here at all. There may be some on the other side of the ridge, said Mary. Well, if there are, they must be a very unenterprising lot, said Tommy. Let's follow up the stream to its source. i never seen the source of a river, and tell me geography, won't it? Besides, our bananas will soon be all gone, and we ought to look for some more. We can't live on nothing but fish. Very well, we will do as you say, said Elizabeth. It's very hot today, so we'll cover our heads with leaves. It's just as well to take precautions. Shortly afterwards, they set out, carrying the oars and the boat hook as weapons of defense. Although they had gained confidence from never having seen any human being, as they had walked beyond the limit of their previous excursion, they felt something in the old timidity and spoke only in whispers. Our flag is still flying, said Tommy, as they came to a spot where they could see the tree. They had climbed on their first day on the island. Evidently, no one has seen it or thought it worth noticing. That's a consolation in one way, said Elizabeth. These South Sea Islanders have canoes, haven't they, Mary? We haven't seen any, which is a negative proof that our island isn't inhabited. But if any people from another island happened to have come this way, they would almost certainly have noticed our flag and perhaps come to see what it meant. They were following the course of the stream. It zigzagged about a good deal, at first through a fairly thick belt of woodland, then through a comparatively clear space of a few hundred yards, then into woodland again, always narrowing. They were still some distance below the crest of the ridge when they came to a small swamp, beyond which there was no stream. It must be the source, said Mary. How disappointing, said Tommy. I want to see a nice little spring with beautiful clear water bubbling up. This swamp is simply horrid. There must be a spring somewhere in the swamp, said Elizabeth, smiling. But it isn't worthwhile to hunt for it, even if we could find it. The stream certainly is prettier lower down. Let's go on. We are not very far from the top. We might be able to get a good view from there, see the whole of the island and the sea beyond. I feel like a discoverer, said Mary. 
Can't you imagine how Drake must have felt when he first caught sight of the Pacific? You romantic old dear, cried Tommy. I don't care a bit what Drake felt. All I hope is we shan't wish we hadn't come. They went on quietly, feeling a little more nervous. The ground here was bare except for a few shrubs, and they drew their breath more quickly as they mounted the slope. At last, they reached the top. One and all gave a sigh of disappointment. Directly in front of them, to the north, was a second ridge higher than the one on which they stood. But on every other side, there was a fine view. To the south, the land fell away rapidly towards the sea, on which they caught a glimpse over the treetops nearly a mile away. To the west, the direction from which they had come, the sea was much further off. To the east, there was a gradual slope downwards into a country, for the metals part densely wooded, while here and there showing traces of clearings natural or otherwise. The greatest extent of land seemed to be to the northeast, where the sea was much further remote than it was on the west. None of the girls had any experience in judging distances, but they saw that the island was longer than it was broad, and that the greatest length was from northwest to southeast. Shall we go to the further ridge? asked Elizabeth. Yes, let's. There isn't a sign of a living creature. The island is just ours. A thick belt of woodland separated the two ridges at the point where they stood, so they moved somewhat to the right to search for a more open way. All at once they came to a halt. A little in front of them was a pole, carrying what appeared to be the remains of a small flag. About 50 paces beyond it was another exactly similar, and then they saw that there were five or six altogether, extending along the crest of the ridge all the same distance apart. I think we had better go back, said Mary, looking a little scared. There are people after all. The sisters were equally disturbed at the sight of the poles evidently erected by human agency. There was nobody to be seen, and from the appearance of the poles they were not attended to. The flags on them were the merest rags of coloured cloth, but the girls were not inclined to face any more discoveries. The bare possibility that there were savages on the island made them shiver. They paused for a few moments at the spot where they first caught sight of the poles, then turned, intending to make their way in the direction of home. Just then, however, Tommy caught sight of some bananas clustering thick a little way down the slope on the eastern side. I'm hungry, she said. Those look bigger than what we've had. Couldn't we go and fetch a few? The clump of trees lay on the slope below the line of poles, a good distance away from them. It's rather silly to be scared so easily, said Elizabeth. There isn't a sign anybody. I think we might venture. We must find a new supply. They moved quickly down towards the trees, listening, peering about them, ready to fly at the least alarm. But when they came to the trees, they felt they had the reward of courage. For there, within a short distance of them, was a sight that made them gasp with surprise and delight. Beside the stumpy, long leaf banana tree, there were other trees glittering with green and yellow fruit and with white blossom. The laden boss bent down invitingly, and beneath them the golden globes of fallen fruit glowed amid the grass. Oranges, I declare, exclaimed Mary. How lovely! cried Tommy, forgetting all her fears and running to forward to pick an orange from the ground. Her sisters followed more leisurely, but before they reached her, Tommy suddenly uttered a cry of terror. The orange she had taken fell from her hand. The other girls ran to her side and found her pale with fright. There, she said, pointing towards a clump of hibiscus. What is it, dear? asked Elizabeth. In the bushes, a little brown face, whispered Tommy with trembling lips. So now they're afraid. They're clearly not the only people on the island anymore. Maybe it'll be like a Man Friday situation? Who knows? Tune in next week to see what happens to the sisters.